Welcome to another Kirkwood Biotechnology video. Today I'd like to talk about PCR, or polymerase chain reaction. This is a common experiment or protocol done in many molecular biology labs around the world. Today I'd like to demonstrate just a little bit about how it works and what are some of its uses. Now as we move on, I want to make a simple analogy for PCR. I want to make a manufacturing analogy. So when you manufacture a product, you essentially need the product, the machine, the blueprint for making the product, the building blocks for the product, the starting material, and then the energy. So in PCR, the product is a specific piece or segment of DNA you're interested in. This may be a gene or something else of interest. You also need the machine, in this case, DNA polymerase, or TAC polymerase. A primer set is your blueprint, so basically what's in between the primers will be amplified. Your building blocks will be your deoxyadenine, deoxythymine, deoxyguanine, and deoxycytosine. Your starting material is going to be the template DNA of interest. This may be genomic DNA, this may be a plasmid, a vector of some sort. And then finally you need your energy. And the energy for polymerase will be adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. All right, once we have all these in the tube now, we're going to cycle it through a couple of temperatures to kind of get the components working and get the results that we want. One of the first temperatures we're going to cycle it through is 95 degrees Celsius. We will then move on to 60 degrees Celsius, or drop it down, and then ultimately 72 degrees Celsius. At 95 degrees Celsius, essentially what we're doing is we're ripping the hydrogen bonds apart between the two nitrogenous bases, or the two strands. And also, what's kind of interesting, at this temperature, normal uh, DNA polymerase, or what would be found in us, for example, would be denatured or essentially cooked, so it would be non-functional. So this is why uh, DNA polymerase from a thermophilic bacteria is going to be used, and that is TAC polymerase in this case. Now we drop the temperature down to 60 degrees Celsius. This temperature will allow the primers to anneal or bind to its complementary sequence on the template DNA. At this point, the DNA polymerase can then bind and then extend and add the bases off. The final temperature of the sequence will be 72 degrees Celsius. This is the optimum temperature for the TAC DNA polymerase. So at this point, that extension of the DNA strand from the primer will take place. Okay, now let's give an example of how PCR might be used in the real world. Uh, normally we don't do PCR just for the sake of doing PCR. So let's say I was interested in Wilson disease. This is a disease, uh, it's a genetic disorder that prevents the body from getting rid of extra copper. So a small amount of copper obtained from your food, which is needed to stay healthy, uh, becomes poisonous because you are unable to basically get rid of it. So it causes a buildup of copper levels over time, which can cause organ damage. All right, so let's say I've obtained samples. So I've got 100 patients that are normal patients and 100 samples that would be defined as having Wilson's disease. What I'm very interested in looking at is whether there's a difference in their sequence somewhere within their genome uh, that may indicate where the problem lies. So what I do is I have obtained their DNA, let's say it's from the cheek cell but I need to find out exactly where the mutation is. So I'm gonna do some work and try to find out uh, what could be interesting for me. All right, since I have all of their genomic DNA, I could sequence all of their genomic sequences, so all 23 sets of chromosomes. But unfortunately, that comes out to be about 3 billion base pairs of DNA. And that's not very practical. It's actually quite cost prohibitive. So what I really need to do is narrow down my search a little bit further. So if I look a little bit more into the research, I notice that actually there's been some studies that implicate chromosome 13 into Wilson's disease. So I could sequence chromosome 13. Unfortunately, that's about 114 million base pairs. Still quite large. So I need to narrow this down a little bit further. So I did a little bit more research in the area and found that a region, 13Q14.3, has been implicated in Wilson's disease. So I'll further look at that region and what I found was a gene called ATP7B, which is a copper transport protein. So this is definitely where I want to look. But if I look at the structure, I notice it has 21 exons, and its transcript, or mRNA, is about 6,000 base pairs. So I don't want to sequence through the whole thing. But I look further at the sequence, and I see that exon 18 seems quite interesting to me. It's about 200 base pairs. 
So this is doable. So here's my sequence. And what I'm going to do next is kind of put it in the form that you're used to. So here's the 5 prime to 3 prime and the double stranded. And now we're going to look at how we're going to utilize PCR. Next I have to design two primers that will flank the region that I'm interested in amplifying. Uh, please notice that I will have a forward primer and a reverse primer and their orientation is 5 prime to 3 prime. The sequences are also complementary to the strand and I have to have one that's complementary to each strand otherwise I will not get the product that I desire. The orientation is important because DNA polymerase only catalyzes the, the addition of nucleotides to 3 prime end. And finally what I want to do is just take you through about three cycles of the PCR reaction. Uh, one of the things to note is it's really not until about cycle three that your actual product you desire is going to be produced. And it's this product, if you pay attention, that will be doubled after every subsequent round. Uh, so the original template DNA is not going to be doubled exponentially or increased exponentially. Only the product between the primers will be uh, increasing exponentially. And here you can see on round three, uh, the highlighted boxes show the actual product that I desire. So once you're done with about 20, 30, 40 cycles, you're going to have a test tube or an Eppendorf filled of the PCR product that you desire. At this point, you may want to go send it in for sequencing, and then you can compare your uh, disease state versus not disease state. You may then put it into a plasmid or clone it into a plasmid uh, for further analysis or to store that sequence away in the freezer. So basically you've got tons of your product and you can do with it as you please. So hopefully you learned a little bit about PCR. I will tell you that PCR is a very widely used protocol used in a number of labs around the world and there are many different varieties of PCR. So what I have given here is an example of just a basic protocol in a standard PCR reaction. Uh, but this will differ in terms of how big of a piece you want to amplify and your particular purpose. So there are lots of different types out there. And also there are some specifics on how primers are designed uh, that I will hopefully go on into in later videos. So thank you for listening.